Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with my co-host, Brian Fabian Crane. Today, we're speaking with Eric Voorhees, who's the founder and CEO of Shapeshift. He's, on the pod- He's been on the podcast. This is his fourth time on the show. Uh, but before we talk to Eric, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors for this week. So Paraswap allows you to beat market prices every single block. It's fast, it's highly liquid, and they just, re- they just launched their V5, uh, which has a new contract and a new API. It's more modular infrastructure, and it has um, more gas-friendly features now, uh, which allow you to save gas on your transaction, which is great. Uh, it supports uh, free approvals using Ethereum's new permit messages. And they also recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon, and BSC. And you can always use Paraswap with your Ledger device right in Ledger Live. So go to paraswap.io to get started. And we're also brought to you by Chorus One. Uh, Proof of Stake is transforming crypto and you can be part of it. So you can start participating in networks, contributing to network security and earning rewards by staking with Chorus One. Chorus One is your staking provider securing billions in assets and over 10,000 customers on 25 networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. If you're interested in running your own uh, branded nodes, they manage white label node as a service offering uh, as a service um, with uh, relying on Courses One's highly available and proving infrastructure that enables you to participate directly in decentralized networks. Course Run also uh, just helped launch Lido for Solana, uh, Solana's liquid staking solution that allows you to stake and participate in DeFi at the same time. So head over to Course One and start your staking journey. Eric Voorhees, thanks for joining us today. We were just talking uh, earlier about how long we've all been here in the space, and um, certainly you know, we we were uh, in touch with um, with Shapeshift at Epicenter like even before Shapeshift was a company. You guys were still stealth. Um, how's it feel to be still here like ten years later? <laughs> feels great. Feels great. Although <laughs> Fiat is still around, so our mission is not complete. Uh, perhaps it'll take another ten years, and I'm ready for that. But yeah, I mean, it's just exciting to see how far this industry has come. And um, I, I look forward to the next 10 years very eagerly. Yeah, I feel like I feel like millennials are like the boomers of the crypto industry now. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, anyone anyone over 30 is like a grandpa. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so like from from like your early ideas of how you wanted this to turn out into like how it has actually unfolded. Uh, you know, what are maybe some of the biggest, I don't know, surprises or the biggest thing you like still wish for that haven't happened yet? <sighs> that hasn't happened yet. Um, I mean, one of the certainly early dreams and predictions of the early Bitcoiners was that uh, people would be using cryptocurrency, Bitcoin for payments, right? And this was like what people's attention went to in the, in the first couple of years trying to get merchants to adopt it and people to accept it. And um, that's had so little success so far, not not zero success, but so little. And I think generally the time when people receive Bitcoin as payment will be sort of the, the end of the process, not the beginning. So that's something that we all got quite wrong. Uh, but so much other interesting stuff beyond payments has happened that it's it's well worth it. Yeah, that's a... Uh... I think that's actually a very interesting observation, right? I mean, obviously, right back then, it was even Bitcoin, right? The electronic cash, and there was so much to focus, and it was big pay and all these payment integration. But it's interesting, like, so your point that, like, so you think that will be the the final stage, or is there something beyond that? Um, I think it's in the it's in the latter part of all the adoption, right? It's when it's when a I don't know, maybe a majority of people in the world are comfortable using cryptocurrency then I think it starts becoming fairly common to pay with it. Uh, but so far that certainly has not happened. What's, so what's, like, we had you on, I think on episode 300, which is probably about two, just over two years ago. Uh, at that point you had just launched uh, Shapeshift V2. This was around the time that Shapeshift had started doing KYC. Uh, what's been the trajectory since then? Like what's been the journey of, of Shapeshift since uh, the last time we had you on? Yeah, well, quite a bit. So that was, you know, kind of around our darkest hour when we had just implemented KYC in the platform and, you know, all of our customers hated it. We hated it. And it was just a, you know, late 2018, most of 2019 was pretty, pretty rough. So that story 
ended, or I would say was resolved uh, in 2021, as we started integrating decentralized exchanges. And by doing that, by integrating decentralized exchanges and simply getting out of the business of trading with customers entirely, um, we were able to remove ourselves from the regulated activity. And so no longer is there KYC on Shapeshift. And that's been the case since April of this year. Yeah, yeah. I remember you, you were you were sort of, this was one of your big uh, selling points right in the beginning, right? Like Shapeshift, no KYC. Because um, probably a lot of people don't remember like Shapeshift, right? But at one point, the original Shapeshift product was like very widely used in the crypto ecosystem. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, it was nice because you could just send out of a Bitcoin there and you got Ethereum on your other address and you didn't have to create an exchange account. And it was like sort of not yeah, quite very, trustless, but... Very civilized. Enough. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you just arrive <laughs> at a website, you say what you want to do and you do it. And that's really all you need. Uh, all the nonsense around the regulatory compliance um, completely destroyed that value proposition. And, you know, we ended up losing 99% of our, our users to other competitors, of which there were many at the time, um, few of whom were as concerned with the regulatory situation as we were by mid-2018. So, yeah, that was, a, that was a difficult time. And the technology of DEXs wasn't, wasn't ready at that time for us to use them. So there were a number of Ethereum-based DEXs that were still order books, and they never achieved sufficient liquidity. Um, the UX was never quite good enough. But once the AMM model came out, you know, I think I think Bancor invented it, but Uniswap certainly popularized it. Uh, that that completely changed it. And the first time I used Uniswap, you know, I was like, wow, these guys, these guys brought back the magic of what Shapeshift done a few years ago. How are they doing this? What what is this? What is this mechanism? And um, just realizing how far advanced that had gotten and that we could just integrate that technology into the Shapeshift platform was uh, was great and very liberating. Hmm. So, I mean, you 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 started off as a uh, as a, a non-custodial exchange, right, where you could just kind of swap one asset for another. We used to call it the Google Translate of cryptocurrency. So <laughs> yeah. Basically, just kind of switch one for the other, convert one for the other. And then, you know, and then that evolved into uh, more of a um, more of a, I'd say like, uh, you know, centralized service where there was like this uh, KYC, even though like the assets were, you know, non-custodied. Uh, so you put this whole company and this team around it. Um, you know, what, explain how you reached the decision now to like go in the full other direction and decentralize shapeshift. Like how did you uh, first, you know, think of doing this and like, uh, how did you reach that, reach that decision? Yeah. So as you mentioned at first, we were a non-custodial exchange where all you could do is trade one asset for another. And um, also around 2018, we released the new platform, which was more like a wallet that integrated exchange into it. Um, so it was still non-custodial and you could use multiple wallets, particularly hardware wallets like Ledger or KeepKey or Trezor. Um, and it would allow you to interact with those assets in a self-custody way through your website and then to do the trades. And the trades were the part that still got stuck in the regulation. And it wasn't until earlier this year, 2021, that we just ripped that entire system out of the platform and hooked up the DEXs. First, Ethereum-based DEXs, and then yeah. ThorChain in April. And by that time, we could get out of that, that business entirely. So since April, Shapeshift does not do any trades with customers any longer and uh, has no KYC anymore because we're not providing a regulated activity. So um, a couple months after that, after April, we announced that we are decentralizing the entire company. And that was certainly a process, you know, like 12, 18 months ago, we were not planning to do that. Um, but as we started realizing the power of these decentralized protocols, as we saw the open immutability of a lot of these DeFi uh, systems, we realized that that's the coolest stuff going on right now. That's like the, the ethos of crypto is best captured in the DeFi projects. And to the degree that we were a centralized company with jurisdictions and with shareholders and with closed source code and all that, um, we would be constantly out of alignment with the coolest stuff that was happening in crypto. So we decided to decentralize, dissolve the entire corporate structure down to zero 
and um, open source Shapeshift and let it be governed by the community of Fox token holders instead of governed ultimately by a group of shareholders. So that's what we announced in July and it's a, it'll be a long process. So we're, we're in the middle of that. Um, but the Shapeshift DAO exists today and is starting to thrive. And um, half of my job right now is just dismantling the, the Shapeshift Corporation. I mean, it seems like I mean, knowing you and your positions on the legal structures uh, that uh, are that exist and um, and like having to do KYC and all this sort of thing. Uh, this se it seems like you were you you know you were destined to do something like this. Um, you know, ha had had you how how much of this do you think has to do with just the timing at which you found a shape shift? Like, if you were had to start over again. Uh, you know, would you be building a DAO from the get-go or would you start a company? Like, you know, yeah, how do you see this? I think this is a really good indication of how far this technology and industry has gone. Because if I went back seven and a half years ago to when Shapeshift was founded, with all the knowledge I have now, there's no way I could do what we're, what we're doing now. Like the tools didn't exist. There was no way to do trades across chains. You know, ThorChain was years away. AMMs didn't exist at all. So... And, and the tooling that we're using as a DAO, like Snapshot and Boardroom and just sort of all the all the social norms that are starting to be built around how DAOs can work, none of that existed. And so we have been trying to adapt as the industry adapts. And it's, you know, it's part of the most inspiring things in crypto is just seeing like how quickly this moves and systems that other people are building, other entrepreneurs are building is actually helping us. And hopefully our software helps other people. Um, that's, that's really cool. I don't think banks, you know, have that advantage, right? Like they're all these closed gardens that are, you know, not helping each other, not innovating in any way. And then you get crypto, which is just this open composable system and the speed and diversity with which it is innovating is, you know, un unreal. So uh, w one thing I'm curious about, so obviously exchange is one of the most like sensitive things from a like regulatory perspective, right? Where they're very much like, oh, if you're like trading something, right? There, there's a lot of attention on that, and so of course it makes sense, and and it's you know very regulated, very hard, right? To build a business that's like you know either you're fully centralized or you know it's a centralized company. But so I'm I'm curious about. Do you think that DAOs have gotten like so much better? at in, in terms of like producing things as a collective that they'll you know outcompete not just in a place like that where regulation ties down centralized companies so much but like across the board yeah uh, you know i'm not someone that thinks DAOs are like a panacea they don't solve every problem and they certainly create a bunch of new ones not every company can or should become a DAO, and DAOs are super experimental and new and there's not any huge success stories of a DAO over enough years to call it conclusive yet. Um, however, you know, beyond just normal financial regulations, the, the friction that you have inside of a company is everywhere. And it, it comes a lot from things like, like here, here's an example. If we want to hire, if we, if we need an engineer to help us with something and we find this amazing engineer in another country as centralized shapeshift, we now have to do a legal review of the HR laws in that country. So that's going to take a while. That's going to cost thousands of dollars. Um, often what happens is that the, the HR laws in those countries are prohibitive and make it super hard either to hire or to fire someone. And if it's super hard to fire someone, that makes it you know less desirable to hire them in the first place because then you can't get out of that situation if it turns bad. So you just get all this friction related to these stupid rules when all you want to do is pay someone to work for you and when that person wants to work for you and get paid. And it should really be that simple. I mean, that's like the civilized way for humans to interact with each other. Two adults want to do something. One wants money. The other wants a service. Make the transaction. And as long as there's no fraud, the government should stay out of it. And um, if you're a centralized company, you, you just can't do that. So as a DAO, if Shapeshift wants to pay any developer in any part of the world, it just does that. You know, <laughs> um, that's one little micro example of how a DAO can operate with far, letter, far less friction than a centralized company. Hmm. And so what's the process of 
decentralizing a company, um, uh, you know, what, what are the steps involved uh, in, in breaking <laughs> apart a, a, a corporate structure and building it into a DAO? Yeah, we're trying to figure that out as we go. There's not really any blueprints for this. Um, first, Shapeshift, the company, is a Swiss AG corp with several subsidiaries in different jurisdictions. We're not converting that company into a DAO. So that's not really what's happening because that doesn't make sense and there's no mechanism by which you do that. We're simply dismantling the company and it's going away. There will be no Shapeshift AG Corporation when this process is done. There will be no bank accounts. There will be no employees. There will be no business contracts. Like that entity is unwinding. Uh, at the same time, in parallel, we're cultivating a DAO of community members. So this is oriented around the Discord, the forum, the snapshot governance mechanisms, and the, the Fox token. So those two things are being done in parallel, the dismantling of corporate structure and the creation of the DAO structure. Um, and each, you know, any company that tries to do this, the steps they need to take are going to be a little bit different. But generally, it's those two halves that we're working on right now. Maybe this is jumping ahead, but one thing I'm like, how do you see Shapeshift as a product uh, evolve in the future? Because, I mean, you still have like Shapeshift.com, right? Where you, I mean, there's like some, like a website. How do you decentralize that? Yeah, so, so Shapeshift, the product is really what matters, right? Like everything about a company that is important is just about building a product that customers like using and that improves their lives. So as a DAO, that's what we get to focus now 99% on instead of, you know, 40 or 50%. And the product is is kind of simple, but it's quite a, a big ambition. It's essentially an open source, multi-chain self-custody crypto interface that the whole world can use. And that vision, I think, is really important. There doesn't currently exist such a thing. And so that's what we're building. Um, and where that product goes and you know that's like the grand vision but the specific tactics that are used and the specific things we do that all comes from the community where people think it's important to to focus and spend money on yeah but i mean there's still like ip there's you know brand names and, and yeah. things like that you know like i'm sure you wouldn't be happy if i started like a competing dao tomorrow called shapeshift right like you know the, 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 well there's we, got to be some sort of structure that you know keeps that stuff right fair yeah so um we are also making a foundation and this foundation is essentially meant to be like a stopgap interim centralized organization to handle everything that we can't decentralize yet. So a lot of things we know how to decentralize today and are working on it. Some things we think can be decentralized, but we can't get to it yet. And then some things we don't know how to decentralize for those latter two categories by default, they just go to the foundation. So that includes things like the IP, for now, that includes the AWS account that's hosting the servers, things like that. Um, but we believe a lot of that stuff can get decentralized with time. And the foundation's mission is to help facilitate that, that decentralization and ultimately unwind and dissolve itself as well. So we don't ultimately care much about IP at all. We're not trying to make money from it. You know, if someone tries to steal the name and mislead people about who is Shapeshift, I think that's something more easily handled on a social layer. Like you can prove what's what with with public private key situations. And um, I think anyone who tries to anyone who tries to do that will run into the network effects of the token itself, right? Like the Fox token has a, a market cap. It has thousands and thousands of users. You can't just like replicate that even if you copy our logo. So I think there are market based mechanisms by which that stuff gets mitigated. Um, and ultimately, we don't we don't much care to protect the IP. We're not trying to do that. We're opening our IP. We're opening our code. What if I got the logo right, so under my keyboard here? Yeah, is, is <laughs> you'll hear thing, from our lawyers soon. Yeah. So, and, and then this application that I'm using is this is going to be like something I download and it runs on my desktop computer, or would it also be through like you know an iOS app store? Yeah, uh, centralized Shapeshift right now has a web app and a mobile app. Open source Shapeshift is going to start with a web app and probably will end up with both a desktop app and mobile app. Um, that will be kind of determined by the community. But yeah, all three of those mediums have uh, pluses and minuses. 
I'm kind of most looking forward to a downloadable one just because the performance is always best. But um, yeah, all, all three will work and we'll use a framework that uh, where the, the same functionality basically can be replicated in, in all three. Yeah, but like, yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to be a DAO and have an Apple developer account, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's so, back to that earlier I, point. We don't know how to solve yeah. that question yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Until, until Apple allows DAOs to have Apple developer accounts, I think there's going to be always some like points of friction. But you're right. I mean, like these things are going to evolve over time. And like if, if the foundation's goal is just to kind of, you know, uh, walk, like sort of go through that process of, of um, decentralizing assets as solutions uh, you know, become available, then yeah, yeah, that's probably like a good the way. The foundation to go will take over the, the Apple account for now. Yeah. No, I was just like, I, I think it makes sense, right? And especially, I think if you have like a desktop version, it's kind of like, uh, definitely seems like manageable, right? Because you could host it on different places too, right? And it doesn't, mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 it is a question I've been wondering about in the end, like how, what is an alternative to the Google App Store and the Play Store, like some kind of crypto-friendly, open, decentralized, you know, mobile operating system because it feels like it would be so useful yeah i mean and that's certainly out of scope for what we're trying to solve but i think that's a that's a service product that the world is going to increasingly demand we're um, going to need a crypto phone someone needs to build a crypto <laughs> phone <laughs> yeah i i think part of our thesis here is that a lot of decentralized systems will get better and better they certainly have been you know they've gone from almost zero value 10 years ago to you know, most of the cutting edge um, computer science right now is going into the these blockchains and all this. So we just we see that continuing, and we will ride that wave uh, as it as it builds. So what happens to the employees? And I mean, there's like seventy people working at Shapeshift, right? Yeah. Like that. Uh, yeah. So by the end of the year, there will be zero employees, and okay. we we have basically three waves where all the employees will be gone. The first one happened at the end of. Uh, August. Second one is at the end of October. And then the third is at the end of December. And by then, you know, even myself will be fired and I will not be CEO of Shapeshift anymore. And um, the employees will then go on to do whatever they want, right? They all have a lot of Fox tokens that unlocked them over the next three years. So they all have a strong economic interest in the success of this continuing. Um, some of them, you know, want to go find a, a W-2 paycheck at, at a normal job and that's fine. Some of them are super excited about the DAO structure and, you know, it's like the best thing that Shapeshift's ever done. So they're going to be participating in, you know, small and big ways to the DAO. Um, and, and ultimately, they all have they all have freedom now and uh, they all can be entrepreneurs and they can participate in the DAO in whatever way they wish. And for some people, that's not a good structure. And for other people, they'll thrive in it. Cool. That's How many amazing. of those employees do you think are going to want to? follow the i mean do you have an idea of how many of those employees are going to want to follow with the the dao structure yeah i, I think i think like at least three-fourths of them really want to proceed with the dao in some way um but it has to make sense right and they have to have a important role that the dao wants to pay for so there will be some who there just isn't a good role in the dao situation and that's just kind of the hard truth of it others will do you know like part-time or casual work once in a while might not be their day job. Um, and others, this is just going to be their full-time focus, just like it was day-to-day -day at Shapeshift. Um, I would guess probably like at least a third of the staff will be heavily involved in decentralized Shapeshift and maybe more than half. Yeah. And I remember one of the, we did an interview with CZ uh, some years ago and, you know, he, uh, talked about the, I think, role there of the, um, these Binance angels, you know, because they had basically also all these people who had a lot of tokens from this token sale on and then had so much money that they just like didn't need to earn anymore. And they were sort of like contributing to Binance, right? Even without their, so I think, you know, I guess if the token does well enough, maybe they don't even have to be paid by the all. Yeah, there, there will certainly be some of that. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I'm in that category, right? So like, I'm not going to be paid by the DAO. I have a lot of Fox tokens and I will be very heavily involved in the DAO, contributing in lots of ways, both in ideas and in capital. Um, but I'm not, 
the chief executive and I won't ultimately make the decisions. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that as well. I think it'll let me be a lot more, uh, a lot more flexible. I don't have to answer to anyone. I can just do whatever I want regarding the DAO. And even to me, you know, that's very freeing. So I, I'm more excited about the future of Shapeshift than I've been in a long time. And I hope that as we build out this model of being a DAO, um, it can help inspire others um, in the same direction. So how do you, like, you know, in, in reality, how, how do you expect your day-to-day -day role to look like? Like, what are you going to be doing after it goes full DAO? What's your, yeah. what are your plans? So, yeah, right now I'm, like, torn between these two worlds. One where I'm trying to dismantle corporate shapeshift and do that responsibly and carefully. And the other where I'm trying to participate in the DAO. But I'm also trying to make sure that I'm not um, leading it too much because it's important that it starts to self-organize and it's done an amazing job with that already. Um, so I, I have to walk a, a careful line there. After December, um, when I am not CEO of Shapeshift anymore, um, I will be more involved in the DAO and I'll try to figure out what's needed. Um, I will probably find pet projects, which I think the product needs, and I will be putting up bounties to work on those. Uh, and I will vote on, you know, the various proposals that are going through and offering my feedback and guidance to anyone that wants it. So I, I plan to be an influential member of the community, but um, hopefully there will be many. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I imagine that's going to be very uh, liberating, you know, after the yeah. sort of formal responsibility. Uh, or I don't know, maybe just to what extent you will feel that same kind of like, you know, responsibility obligation then to the doll but at least yeah, well, legally speaking you don't have it anymore right yeah i mean for several years now i have had to censor myself significantly in what i want to say publicly what i can say publicly what i want to advocate for part of that comes from just being prudent from a regulatory perspective but the other part is that i have all these shareholders and all these employees that rely on shapeshift being present and successful. And so it's a, it's very difficult to know, like to what degree I want to be, to live up to my ideals and say the things that I want to say, some of which are very controversial and all of which are very much uh, against the orthodoxy of modern society, um, you know, versus being responsible for the people that have put their trust in me. And both of those things are really important. They are sometimes conflicting principles in the DAO structure. I can do whatever I want. And I still need to be a little bit careful, right? Because my name and my brand is attached to Shapeshift and it will be for a long time. But um, Shapeshift is is bigger than me already. And uh, we'll, you know, I'll be a smaller and smaller part of it. Okay, so the day after the, the company is dissolved, you have to come back on so you can just like <laughs> take the gloves off and <laughs> say what you really want to say. It probably won't be that black and white. Eric, uncensored. <laughs> move, we will move a little bit more in that direction. And and then when you when you think of the future uh, of the DAO, like what what are your sort of hopes for how this shapeshift DAO phase will uh, play out? Yeah. So when I look at the crypto industry, I see so much fascinating work, so many fascinating products. It's too much to keep up with, and it's overwhelming. And my vision as a product for shapeshift is that it is the place in which all these projects can be integrated. And so people have one interface in which they can interact with digital assets. It has to be self-custody. It has to integrate with multiple wallets and it has to be cross-chain and it has to be open source and it has to be governed and owned by the community. So all of that now is, is possible with the new Shapeshift. And you know, if we look forward a few years, um, my hope is that Shapeshift is serving you know, 100 million people around the world with an open, immutable, neutral interface in which they can interact with financial assets. Um, that's that's my dream for it. And I think that's really uh, something that I'm going to be excited to work for, uh, you know, over many years. Yeah, no, it's just like that, that. that is like a product, right? That, yeah, does feel very needed, right? Because today you're kind of scattered, right? Like maybe there's like, you know, MetaMask and Kepler and then, you know, other wallets or Ledger Live, or there's just a lot of different user interfaces for different chains. But so is, this would be sort of the, 
the one wallet, would it have a particular focus, for example, on trading, or you think it would be a sync, you know, it would kind of cover like the entire spectrum of, of, of what you want the wallet to do? It, it obviously can't do everything, right? Like it, it has to focus, but if it's open enough, then people that want to integrate with it can pull it in the directions that they see interesting. And so it will end up resembling what the market really desires over time. Um, and that's that's the goal there. I mean, the the table stakes are, you know, easy wallet functionality, send, receive, trade, I'd say, you know, lend and stake, you know, like there are a few verticals that are kind of table stakes, I would say for a good integrated wallet. Um, and then beyond that, you know, there could be all sorts of long tail applications built into the platform. And um, the teams that build those can just put it into the open source software themselves. It doesn't have to go through a bottleneck of, of shapeshift engineering any longer. And um, do you see, yeah. Do you also see a sort of like app store? Um... So, sort of. Uh, anyone can build in an app into the shapeshift uh, platform. And so we, we will see if the market wants, you know, kind of everything available, which would be noisy, or just a very curated type of experience. I don't know which direction it should go. The community will will take it there. Right. But I guess eventually you'd imagine that like, okay, you'd want different people to like use different kind of interfaces, different features, different applications, you no, know, because there's so already so much different stuff that people are doing. Yeah, and I think ultimately people will end up building different skins and interfaces for it, some of which cater to particular segments, right? Like an advanced trading interface that gives you a lot of tools meant for that. And another which might be a super simple, like you're a brand new crypto noob interface that abstracts most of the complicated stuff away. Um, I don't know which of those directions it should go, and it can go in both now and people can just build onto this thing what they what they want. It's kind of an experiment in in um, spontaneous order. And now that it's open and there's an economic incentive of all the people that hold the Fox token, um, it can it can go in that direction. So you talked a little bit about, you know, cross-chain compatibility uh, earlier, and I wanted to ask you about that and like, what, what are your hopes for Shapeshift to become uh, like a major sort of cross-chain um, well, and a way for people to to be able to trade assets cross chain, and what are some of the challenges you see there, whether technical or you know community uh, type challenges? Yeah, cross chain is really hard because these blockchains are they're all fussy in their own ways. They have different structures and architecture, and if you focus on one, you can get really good at that, right? And a lot of the biggest and best Ethereum community apps. They just focused on Ethereum. They work really well in that regard and they're awesome, but they only work in Ethereum, right? And they, they don't even include like the largest asset in the world, you know, Bitcoin. They don't include some of these other chains that I think are really important. So we have always been multi-chain and that, is, that has been hard. It's been really hard and it's made us go more slowly, um, but I think it's critical. We did not know how to do cross-chain trading without an intermediary before ThorChain. So pre Thorchain, which launched in April, there was no way to do at scale native layer one asset trades from from like ETH to Bitcoin. You had to do it with like wrapping and then going over only in the ETH ecosystem. Um, that's OK and that's valuable, but there really needs to be a way to trade native assets across chains. And so when Thorchain launched, that was like the last piece of the puzzle. So Shapeshift was the first you know, known company to integrate Thorchain back in April when it launched. And um, it's had lots of <laughs> struggles over the summer. It got hacked like multiple times and shut down again. And so they've been fixing it. Uh, I'm still very bullish on it. And when it comes back, you know, we will absolutely support it again. And uh, it's, it's a critical piece of infrastructure. So I'm glad people are building it and tackling that really hard challenge. Have you heard this? Uh, I'm sure you've seen this proposal uh, to integrate uh, Osmosis uh, and uh, with Shapeshift. Are you, are you? How do you feel about the Cosmos ecosystem as a way to facilitate cross-chain uh, transactions? Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of Cosmos. Um, it's been one of the projects I think which is 
underrated and underappreciated. And they've just been chugging away, building some of the best technology with a really good community in the ecosystem without nearly as much hype as some of the other projects. Um, it's a little hard to understand it because you have like the Cosmos hub, which is its own chain. And then you have this universe of other um, Cosmos SDK slash Tendermint chains, all of which build an application specific blockchain using the using some of the patterns of Cosmos. And they've generally been disconnected from each other. So if you're using one, like you're, you can't, it's not cross compatible with the others. Uh, IBC, Interblockchain Communication, solved that earlier this year, but now these different blockchains still have to integrate with each other. So it's a long process of this integration of these disparate chains. So co the Cosmos ecosystem from the perspective of interoperability is, is great, but there's a big asterisk. All of the interoperability between Cosmos chains happens between only the Cosmos SDK chains. There's no operability between native Bitcoin or native ETH and the Cosmos hub, at least not yet. So um, I don't know if that can be solved through Cosmos technology or not, but it certainly is solved through ThorChain. And interestingly, ThorChain was built on the Cosmos SDK. So it itself is becoming integrated into these other Cosmos chains. And I, I see a really interesting kind of, you know, point of like a collection point around which all these chains are starting to to merge and talk to each other. I think by next year, the interoperability of a lot of these things is gonna be quite advanced and, and really profound. Yeah, no, I think that was a fantastic sort of Cosmos overview. And I think for me also, like actually Osmosis has been really amazing as sort of like, okay, here's this use. Cause in the end, right? Okay, it can't quite do what Torchain can do at this point, right? Because it's, you know, it relies on IBC, it doesn't have these kind of bridges yet. But just in terms of a user, as an IBC user experience, it's, it's like very nice. Now oh, yeah. You can see like, oh, this works like pretty well, right? So yeah. if you compare it with like an Ethereum user experience, where you have like MetaMask and approve something, it's, it's you know, it's better. Yeah, Osmosis was fantastic. I mean, some of the best UX I've seen in a crypto app. And it was the first time that I had used IBC. So Osmosis had integrate, integrated three or four other Cosmos-based zones, including the Cosmos hub itself. So I you know, went through the motion of depositing some native Cosmos atoms into Osmosis through IBC. And it was essentially as easy as depositing crypto into a centralized exchange, um, roughly about that easy. And if I didn't know what IBC was, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. I wouldn't have realized that these were different chains that had just moved my atom from one to the other quite seamlessly. But knowing IBC and experiencing that, I was like, yeah, this is this is a little taste of what's to come. And um, you know, as especially like as the Terra ecosystem starts to integrate through IBC with with the other Cosmos zones, uh, this stuff's just going to get it's it's so exciting. I mean, I can't keep up with all of it. <laughs> <laughs> so for now, uh, at the moment though, so sh Shapeshift currently in, in its uh, DEX form um, is going to be primarily you know, focused on Ethereum assets and Bitcoin through ThorChain? Yeah, so I'll give you a complicated answer because things are complicated right now. Centralized Shapeshift, you know, if you go to shapeshift.com or use our mobile app right now, all of that is still closed source and all of that is centralized. All trading done through those apps are done through DEXs. Shapeshift is not a DEX. We route all trades through other DEXs. So we're using the Matcha API for anything ETH and ERC20 related that you know connects to like 10 different AMMs on Ethereum. And then we're using ThorChain for anything involving you know, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, and the other chains that get added to that Binance chain. Um, <laughs> We also now have the open source Shapeshift, which has just been opened and isn't hosted yet, but that code is out there. Currently, that's Ethereum only, and it will have Bitcoin integrated into it soon. I expect that within three to six months, that open source version of Shapeshift will outpace the closed version of Shapeshift. And so the chains that get integrated into that is really whatever the community wants. Um, and it'll probably follow roughly where the market caps go of these different ecosystems. So how how do you think Shapeshift will compete with 
you know, other DEXs and AMMs in the ecosystem that, you know, already have quite a bit of network effects around them. Like, yeah. So again, we're not an AMM, we're not a DEX and we're not trying to compete with DEXs. We integrate DEXs. And so the more and the more liquid they are, the better for us. Even today, someone gets a much better deal going to Shapeshift than if they went to Uniswap directly because you're getting the exact same rates. Shapeshift adds no spread and adds no fees of any kind, but Shapeshift gives you some Fox tokens on top of it. So if you're going to do a trade on, on Ethereum through an AMM, um, unless you're using layer twos, which we don't support yet, then going through Shapeshift, even if we route your order through Uniswap, you're going to get a better deal through Shapeshift. Um, so yeah, we, we're not trying to compete with those the more, the more, the better. Okay. So then it'll look more like a decentralized DEX aggregator or AMM aggregator than a DEX itself. Yeah. It's really like an, a decentralized protocol aggregator, right? So exchange is one function that you can do within Shapeshift, but as we add lending markets and staking markets and all the normal wallet functionality, um, it's about more than just exchange, but that's certainly a core component. And so you then have uh, this this DAO on Ethereum, right? Where you have votes, and and I guess you know that's one thing, right? Like you can use the Fox token, maybe vote on different features to add. But there's another thing, which is okay. There's like a code base, and is there you know how do you deal with that thing? And you know GitHub maintainers, or yeah, so that this, this that would ra be a radical, no. That'd be a better question for our for our engineers, but yeah, generally the open source project anyone can contribute to. There's a limited number of people that can merge the PRs. That group will grow, you know, as the group that's there now starts to trust more and more people. Um, but those people don't have to ultimately be from Shapeshift, the company, and they are now building onto Open Shapeshift. They're not they're not making pull requests to the closed source shapeshift. So the, the security parameters are a lot, a lot different and we can be a lot more open and experimental. So let's talk about the Fox token a little bit. Um, you've, you've had a token for some time now. Um, what is going to be the goal of the Fox token moving forward and how is it being distributed to, yeah, how's it being distributed as, as uh, shapeshift moves into a DAO form? Great question. So back in 2017, when everyone and their grandmother was doing a token sale, um, we were very conflicted because we saw the power of tokens and how cool they are and like that they were a real innovation and were very important. And at the same time, you get like a million different scams and people selling these tokens and then never building anything. And it was a big, big mess. Um, so we wanted to have a token ever since then, but we wanted to be very careful about how we went about it. And we ended up um, releasing our token in 2019. Shapeshift has never sold this token. We just created it and we held on to about 99.9% .9 of it um, since 2019. We had been giving it out to users for various promotions, you know, like when you're doing trades or if you sign up with us, but the vast majority was just held by us uh, up until this year when we decided, okay, we're now ready to know what we, what we do this token. Um, so this was a critical part of the decentralization. I don't know that a DAO can exist without a token because all the economics and the governance have to accrue to something that is distributed. Uh, so for us, that is the Fox token. And we did the world's largest airdrop. We airdropped to about 1.1 million addresses, uh, all the past users of Shapeshift, um, anyone that had a key key, uh, the entire Thorchain community and a bunch of people that held tokens in a bunch of the DeFi protocols that we had been inspired by, you know, including Uniswap and Gitcoin and a number of others. So we just dished out, uh, it was about a third of all the tokens, 300 something million tokens out to the world. Um, and then we put about a quarter of all the tokens in the treasury. So at that point, more than half of all the tokens uh, became you know, pu public. They went out to the public or they went into the treasury controlled by the people that own the tokens. About a third of the tokens went to all the insiders. So we gave them to employees, we gave them to shareholders. All of those batches um, unlock over three years. So those people all have an alignment with the long-term success of the project. And then the balance there is going to the foundation. And so the foundation will have some tokens to do with what it wants. Okay, I need to check my uh, keep key then. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, any, anyone <laughs> anyone should check the the Shapeshift AirDrop page because you may have addresses that you didn't realize are valid, and um, any address gets at least two hundred Fox tokens and sometimes more. So that's hundred bucks right now. Some some people are getting like a few thousand dollars worth of tokens. So yeah, take take nice. thirty seconds and check a few addresses there. <laughs> So uh, I'd like to maybe, you know, uh, Brian, unless you have uh, more questions about, you know, Shapeshift and the Fox token, I'd, I'd like to maybe take a step back a little bit and talk about the ecosystem and sort of your views about where things are going, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So I, I've been thinking a lot about this lately and as I've started to become interested in, in you know, new layer ones, like, you know, obviously like been interested in Cosmos for a while becoming interested in Solana and things like that. And, you know, there's this old saying in business that um, there's no such thing as a first mover advantage. And, you know, we've certainly seen this in like, you know, Web2 companies like MySpace no longer exists anymore. And, you know, no nothing tells us that Facebook will continue to exist in the next five years. And um, I wonder, you know, in, with regards to Bitcoin and Ethereum, do you think that uh, they may also suffer from this uh, plagued first mover advantage, you know, first mover position, and that you know, other blockchains at some point will become uh, much more prevalent in terms of use and you know attracting investors and developers and things like that. Yeah, great question. Uh, I don't think it's a binary question of whether first mover advantage exists or not. I mean, it, there is a first mover advantage. It's a question of to what degree it's useful. So Bitcoin had a huge advantage by being first. And similarly, Ethereum had a huge advantage in being the first you know, EVM smart contract platform. Those give it a great head start, but they're certainly not, um, they don't make it immune to competition. So ultimately I see a world with, you know, millions and billions of different assets and maybe several dozen, maybe a hundred uh, chains. Um, not thousands of chains, you know, something like five to a hundred chains seems like where this will end up because these blockchains are complicated engineering machines and they make trade-offs. And some of these trade-offs are really good for certain use cases and they make it poor for others. So I, I don't see a world in which one chain does everything best for everyone. That seems unrealistic. Um, the example between Bitcoin and Ethereum is a good one because Bitcoin now has this slow conservative culture don't change things too much if at all don't break things um maintain fidelity to you know this one very narrow focus on being money good good sound money and ethereum is a little more wild right more innovative more fast moving it changes fundamental structures like 1559 that just went live this summer that's a it's a big change and it just kind of happened um and more will happen. The, the move to proof of stake is a massive change. And so you, you get these two systems, um, one which is slower and conservative and one which is faster and uh, much more willing to try new things. Both of those are really valuable, right? Slow and conservative is very valuable for money. Fast and innovative is very valuable for a smart contract platform that's trying to let people build new apps in, in DeFi. So I just I see value in both of these things, and I, I know there will be other chains that make different sets of trade offs. You know, certainly Solana is fast as hell. You know, probably the fastest popular chain in existence. That's a that's a really important attribute, but it is not the only attribute, and they have had to make design trade offs to achieve that. So a world with with a number of different chains optimizing for different features, I think that's a healthy world. I think that's part of the decentralization that we should all want. I don't think anyone should desire a world where there's only one blockchain. I mean, that is that is a monolith. That is centralization of a form. So I, I love the preponderance of this. And I, I just love the like hyper capitalistic open market competition that we're all getting to witness. I think so one theme a little bit, I would say in your, uh, you know, in your journey in this crypto land, right, is that you were always very, uh, political and you know always cared a lot about you know ideas around your liberty and freedom and very strong opinions there they're like um, and now you know crypto is progressing of course the world is also changing in other ways you know there's like corona that has had a big impact and um, 
you know, countries evolving in different ways. Like how, how do you see this playing out? Like, cause in some ways there's some sort of like, uh, things clashing against each other there, you know, like it. Yeah. Well, I got interested in Bitcoin fundamentally, uh, because I thought it was important for the world to separate money and state. Like that was the original name of my blog back in the day, money and state. Money is so important and is so critical to people's lives. It is so central to it, to so much that they do. It cannot be controlled by a monopoly coercive provider. It just, that is just not a good way to, to build a society. So this has always for me been about building an industry that pulls money and finance out of the control of a monopoly provider and into an open market. That's it. So yeah, it is political. And <laughs> that tension you mentioned is going to get crazier and crazier because you, you have this, these, these inventions starting with Bitcoin and now this whole world of different blockchains, which are immutable. They can't be turned off. They can't be stopped by any single person or even a, a group, right? Like, like they just will, it's like a boulder that's been thrown down the hill and no one can, no one can stop it. And then you have governments and regulators, many of whom exist solely to monitor and control money, which now can't be monitored or controlled in the way that they want. So what happens when you get systems which can't be monitored or controlled and then regulators, which only exist to monitor and control, both of those things are now running wild in the world and they are clashing in a huge way. And it's going to be very awkward, <laughs> difficult, problematic, antagonistic for years. Wh which side wins? Because these are mutually exclusive phenomena, right? A money that can't be governed or people that want to govern money that have all the guns and all the power. Which system wins? Um, my bet is on open decentralized technology that makes the world wealthier and freer. I think over time that tends to win. And I think coercion and violence and uh, monopoly control uh, tends to lose, but it, it could get, it could be a very problematic conflict and we're seeing it all over the place. Yeah. I think awkward accurately describes, <laughs> accurately describes the feeling uh, that I get when, when talking with, you know, any, anyone who's involved with regulation. So, you know, if you don't know, in case you don't know, like I, I, I helped co-found, uh, the French, um, crypto lobbying association. So we're a member organization and we lobby the government and we're now like moving into the EU and, you know, there's this dance that happens in these conversations where, you know, we're sort of like all stepping around the reality that, you know, crypto is here to dis to disrupt what you're doing. And like nobody in crypto wants to say it, and they certainly don't want to admit that it's a threat. But, you know, I think some of the people that have been reluctant to join as members of this organization are the ones that are on the side going like, screw these guys, <laughs> we're trying to disrupt them. Like you should on, you know, be honest and upfront about it. But of course, you know, when you're having political you know, conversations that you know, where you're trying to get ahead, you can't really do that. But yeah. um but that's, I think that's what I've, this is what I've learned in the last two years is that, that like there's this elephant in a room and the elephant in the room is like, you're going to lose your job, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I want to, I want to comment on that. So the purpose of crypto is not to cause regulators to lose their job and is not to disrupt regulators. That's not what, that's not the reason for being. Well, it's to disrupt concentration right? of power. Like uh, it's, it's to, it's to move the concentration of power over money from a closed group out to the periphery of all humanity, right? It's to move that locus of power out to a decentralized base from a centralized core. That's a very, a very positive message. I mean, it's essentially the empowerment of all people on earth, right? So like, how can you be, how can you be against that? You can be against that if you want the power instead, right? If you want it to be collective and focused in your organization, then of course you're gonna be opposed to that. Um, but I do think it's important for people in this industry to to try to focus on the positive goals here. And as much as I would love to see every regulator lose their jobs because I have a grudge against them and I see the, them like, <laughs> you know, ruining lives all over the place with the best of intentions, um, that isn't the message really that we should be trying to, to spread. It should be about open, immutable, fair, transparent, objective 
finance and money for all people on earth. Yeah. I mean, I think if you kind of compare those two worlds, like the thing that gives me a lot of confidence also that the, the crypto world is the thing that's going to prevail is just if you look at like the speed at which things change, right? You have like crypto, which is just at an insanely fast rate and it, it's getting faster and faster and faster. And, you know, there's a lot of like fundamental reasons for that. And I think decentralization is like a huge part of it, right? That like you remove so much friction. And then you have on the other hand, whatever, a nation state, right? That has to make decisions in this like super flawed way and very slow. And I mean, if you, it's just, you know, absurd, like, you know, whether it's Trump or Biden, the kind of people who end up like, yeah, uh, also having a role, a, a role that's basically like impossible to do a good job in. Yeah, the from the moment Bitcoin started, uh, regulators and the government has been falling further and further behind for a long time because they ignored it and they laughed at it and they thought it was stupid. I think that phase is over. They realize that it's real and serious. Um, but for every step they make, crypto takes 10 steps and it takes 10 steps in like five different directions. It's not just that crypto is moving faster, it's that it's becoming more diverse, right? This isn't just Bitcoin anymore about like narrow money. You have this entire DeFi world, you have all these NFTs now, you have these distributed consensus mechanisms doing all manner of things. And how in the world does a government keep up with even one of those branches, let alone the whole tree? So yeah, I don't see how that changes. You know, the, the most, the most progressive within the government maybe understand Ethereum a little bit. You know, that's like 2016 level understanding here. And we, we're five years past that, you know? So <laughs> try to tell them about like pulling out liquidity pool tokens and, and staking it in a yield farm. I mean, a, a year ago, that was kind of foreign to me and I'm in this stuff 24 seven. So yeah, I, I love that it can move so quickly. I think that is one of its strongest advantages. Um, and ultimately it's doing all this peacefully. It's doing it without coercion. It's doing it without violence. It's just the open market trying to innovate and people can opt in and use it if they want. I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I've certainly lost faith in a lot of our government institutions uh, since dealing with them on an increasing basis, um, you know, whether elected or non-elected, but uh, I guess that's a topic for another episode. Um, but, you know, before we wrap up here, you know, You've been in the, in this industry for for a long time. You know, you, you started uh, at BitInstant, and then you know you did Satoshi Dice, and and now Shapeshift. And um, you know, looking back on this, you know, what are you the most proud of? What are you you know what are you the most proud of having accomplished uh, since you've been in the space? And you know, how how do you sort of you know, summarize like what you think your accomplishment and what you've brought to the space has been. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, one weird answer, uh, is that back in 2012, so I got into the, into Bitcoin in 2011, there was a bubble in early 2011 and then it, it petered out after May of 2011 and Bitcoin started declining down to like $2 and very few people were interested in, in it and most of the people that were lost interest and, and left and that looked like that was the Beanie Babies bubble and it was over, right? It looked dead. And so for over a year, it was like in that miserable state. And when I started Satoshi Dice, I certainly didn't think it would be this big and I certainly didn't, I can't take a lot of credit for it because a lot of it was just kind of accidental success. But if you look at the transaction chart of Bitcoin, uh, April of 2012 is when Satoshi Dice launched and it, you basically see this like flatlining transaction quantity until April of 2012 when it just spikes and ever after that it just is going up and up and up and up and maybe that's a coincidence maybe but I I like to think that maybe like Satoshi Dice sparked sparked a realization among people of a way to use blockchains that just compounded itself and so that's part of I, that might be my answer of what I'm most proud of, because if I could do anything in those early days when no one cared about it, like giving it a little kick of life that then caught on and a million other people took it from there, you know, I'd, I'd be very proud of that. It's, it's hard to know to what degree it was Satoshi Dice or not. Um, 
other than that, I think <laughs> I have tried to consistently convey the principles on which this stuff is is based. And it's such a noisy industry with so many people chasing a quick buck and so many scammers and just like so much noise and nonsense. It's trying to remind people for a decade that this is about liberty and this is about empowering all people with sovereignty over their own money. Um, I've tried to stick to that principle no matter what. And so hopefully that has been that has been helpful. And I, I see my role as just helping to cultivate that culture and continuing to, to speak it. Yeah, no, you have definitely done that. And I think you've also articulated that well. And I think you've definitely been like an inspiration in the industry in that way. Um, well, I mean, in this next phase of Shapeshift, right? Well, DAO means there will be ways, more ways for people to like, you know, get involved and be a part of it and contribute. And like, what are, for people who are interested in that, um, how should they go about it? And like, what's your, and if you have any kind of advice or message for people? Yeah. I mean, we, into this world? we are learning DAOs as we go. So I don't want to pretend I'm an expert. Like I'm a noob to DAOs, but the more I learn about them and the think about their potential consequences, the more enthusiastic I get. They're kind of like taking the principle of decentralization that Bitcoin did for money and applying it on a social level, which is super profound. Um, Anyone that wants to get involved in the Shapeshift DAO, which has already gotten a lot of activity and which has been pretty exciting to see, uh, can go to the Shapeshift Discord. Um, I mean, go to shapeshift.com. There's links at the bottom to, the, to our Discord. That's the best place to start. And you can participate at whatever level, including just being a lurker and watching uh, how it's all going. We record all of the Discord uh, meetings that we do on a weekly basis. And so a lot of this stuff will just kind of be public and, and maybe can be helpful for other DAOs that are trying to get going. Um, I fundamentally think that DAOs are a, like the next chess piece move in terms of regulation. Um, I do not believe that most regulation can apply when it's a DAO structure. And that doesn't mean that all regulation doesn't apply. And it certainly doesn't mean that the regulators can't change things in the future. But for now, I think there is this, this open door of decentralized groups um, and I'm going to run through that door and, and see how many people can go through it as well. So I, I find it fascinating. And I've been inspired by other people that have taught me how these DAOs work, you know, because they uh, on their surface, they seem a little kumbaya. And when you start realizing that how they can work and you start seeing the tools that have been built for them, they're getting legitimate and um, kind of profound. Yeah, well, Eric, thanks so much for joining us today. I think that was really amazing to like go through that. And it's also so so great that we've been able to sort of accompany you through all these different stages. And I'm super excited to see like what this next stage of your own journey and Shapeshift's journey will be. Yeah, well, I, I want to thank you guys for being so long a source of signal in all the noise. You know, you, this has been one of the podcasts that I listen to regularly and has been so consistent for years. Uh, so thank you guys for the continued work. You mentioned like episode 300 I was on last time. So I don't know what episode you guys are at at this point, but it's, that's impressive. You know, that, nine, that's, so. yeah, that's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of work and a lot of time. And so I yeah. just, I appreciate you and anyone in this industry that has helped bringing the signal through the noise. So thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, thanks for coming on. And I've got a I've got a quick little announcement before we wrap up here. Uh, um, so I've I've been working with the team over at Zengo. They're a crypto wallet, and they've been on the podcast before. And we've launched a, a new podcast series uh, together called the Zen Crypto Show. And this podcast isn't meant for any of you who listen to this podcast because it's it's uh, because you know all of you are you know crypto nerds and understand crypto very well. This is meant for you know your friend who's like texting you on WhatsApp and like asking you, you know, what's this crypto thing? Should I be buying into it? It's meant for your mom. It's meant for, you know, like people who are uh, really early into crypto and just want to learn more about it. In fact, you know, the episodes are very short. They're 10 minutes long and each episode covers, you know, one topic. So like we did one episode explaining Bitcoin. And before we released this episode, like it was vetted by my mom. So like, you know, if she, she was able to understand it, then anybody can. So we've got episodes about Ethereum. Basic concepts like what what is money, 
what is uh, what are NFTs, you know, what are cryptocurrencies and, and sort of bite sized content. So uh, if there's anybody in your life who uh, you know wants to learn about crypto, the Zen Crypto Show uh, is um, probably one of the one of the best podcasts, I think, uh, to get started. So you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and anywhere else. So, and you look for a Zen Go or Zen Crypto Show, the Zen, Zen Crypto, crypto show. show. And it, that's uh, one word or several, uh, several words. Yeah. The Zen, Zen crypto, crypto Show. show. OK, OK. So I hope you guys will like it. Yeah. I had an uh, electrician at my house yesterday asking about Bitcoin and he total new, total noob. So that's pr probably exactly the kind of person I should send this to. This, yeah, this is yeah, who it's for, man. Yeah. Zen Crypto Show. Zen Crypto Show. <laughs> <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> All right. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds like a great, great thing. Um, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. All right. See then thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, guys. See ya. Bye.